now my pleasure to bring up our next speaker, Gary Powers Jr., who will talk about the YouTube incident during Oswald's stay in the USSR. And I give you Gary Powers Jr. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much for the warm welcome. It's great to be here in Dallas with you all to find out the truth and learn more about the Cold War as well as the JFK assassination. And for this particular presentation, my father, Francis Gary Powers, shot down May 1st over the former Soviet Union. As some of you might know, uh, there is a Lee Harvey Oswald connection to my father, the U-2 incident. Uh, some of you might have read that Lee Harvey Oswald was a Marine at Usugi Air Base in Japan as a radar operator. Usugi is where U-2s would land and or take off. So he was able to get uh, the altitudes of which the U-2s were flying as a marine uh, radar operator. He defects in 1959. My father is shot down in 1960. There is some debate as to whether it was a true defection or a false flag defection. I don't know for sure. I do know that he had access to the altitudes the U-2s were flying. And coincidence is that, assuming that he defected, he would give information to the Soviets, whether on his own accord or whether told to do so. And if this was the case, my assumption is that he gave out the altitude the dad was flying or the U-2s were flying back in the 1950s. It makes sense. There is no proof, however, that I've ever found to confirm that. So it is, is this connection. Dad comes home in 62, Oswald comes home a, a few months later, and then the rest you know. So there is that connection with Oswald and the U-2 incident, which I find very interesting. Now, in regards to my father and what I'll be talking about today, I'll be talking about Dad, the U-2 incident, the conspiracy theories, and setting the record straight. So um, when I was growing up in Southern California, I was aware that my father had been shot down over the former Soviet Union, imprisoned by the KGB, and ultimately exchanged for a Soviet spy. But as a kid growing up in this family, this was all very normal. We talked about this. I was aware of this. So my perception as a young kid was that everybody's dad had been through something like this. <laughs> that perception changed on August 1st, 1977, when my dad died in a helicopter crash while working for NBC television. At that time, I was 12 years old. I come home to a house full of people who inform my mom and I the bad news. Our lives are turned upside down, and I become very introverted. I have just lost my father. Not only have I just lost my father, I am trying to find out more about him, who he is. Everybody's talking to me about him. They are asking me questions. I don't know how to answer them. I don't even really know much about it. I'm 12 years old. And so throughout high school, very introverted. College came out of my shell. I was curious. Started to ask more questions to family members, trying to find out what the dad went through, what the U2 incident was all about, uh, and being able to answer questions that were asked of me. When I started my research, I did not start to vindicate my father. I started so I could find out the truth, so I knew how to answer questions. And so for the last 25 plus years now, I have been reading, writing, talking to first-hand participants, people who flew with my father, knew my father, uh, the Soviet uh, missile engineer who designed the missile, one of the KGB agents who uh, asked the interrogation questions in the jail cell, uh, and other people uh, from around the world associated with the U-2 incident, U-2 program, and or my father, trying to find out the truth so I knew how to answer questions. And so I've read during my research uh, numerous conspiracy theories about what took place on May 1st of 1960. I've read that it was sabotage and that a Norwegian spy planted a bomb in the tail section. I've read it was our own government, the CIA, who intentionally sabotaged the mission to perpetuate the Cold War by ruining the summit conference that was planned for May 16th of that year. I've read it was pilot error, that dad had a mechanical malfunction or allowed the plane to have a flame out that forced it to a lower altitude. And my favorite theory comes from a television show called Dark Skies from about 15 or 20 years ago now. They attribute the U-2 incident to an encounter with a UFO. <laughs> so we have all these alleged theories. Now from what my father told me as a young man, from what he wrote about in his book, his memoirs, he takes off from Peshawar, Pakistan, May 1st, 1960, uh, 6 a.m., 
crosses over the Soviet Union's border at approximately 68,000 feet. He starts uh, to flip on and off the camera switches that will take the photographic imagery of the ground below. He's four hours into his mission. He's now at an altitude of 70,500 feet over the city of Sverdlovsk. There's a bright orange flash. Shockwave hits the plane. There was no flame out. There was no, no descent. He was hit at altitude by one of three Soviet SA-2 missiles. It explodes behind the tail section. It pushes the plane forward, throws my father back in his seat. My dad realizes something's gone wrong. The controls no longer respond. As a result, the nose pitches forward, the wings snap off, and he finds himself spinning down towards the ground in the wreckage. He falls from 70,500 feet to 30,000 feet before bailing out of the aircraft. He does not use the ejection seat. If he did, he would have severed his legs on the way out. The U-2 cockpit is very small, very tight, very compact. In order to eject, you gotta be in a perfect position or else you could lose a limb. Realizing this, he does the following. He opens up the canopy, floats off into space, undoes his harness, and is immediately sucked up halfway out of the plane, still connected by his air hose. Not fully out of the cockpit, two or three feet, dangling, trying to get to the strut button, falling down through, being banged around. Can't get to the strut button. Can't um, uh, maneuver uh, in the right position to uh, use the ejection seat or to do the strut button as he's falling out of the sky. So he's realizing he's getting closer and closer to the ground. He breaks free of the air hose falls free of the airplane, his parachute opens automatically at 15,000 feet, he parachutes down to the ground. He's captured, turned over to the KGB, put up in Lubyanka prison for three months of solitary confinement and interrogations. So during this time period, he's trying to keep as much secrets as possible from the Soviets. He did not spill his guts. He did not collaborate with the enemy. He did not land the plane intact. Um, uh, which is another rumor that had gone around at the time. And so these three months, he's trying to keep back as much information as possible, mislead them in any way he can. Sentenced to 10 years in prison, serves two years of that sentence, Vladimir prison. February 10th, 18 months after the trial, 21 months total of incarceration, he is exchanged for Soviet spy Rudolf Abel. Abel was caught in America in the late 50s, James Donovan, an attorney, represented him at trial and then brokered the exchange between my father and Rudolf Abel behind the scenes. February 10th, 1962, a cold, dark, foggy morning, right out of a John Le Carré novel, two spies on each side of this bridge, the Glenacre Bridge, Potsdam, Germany. They're positively ID'd. They walk home to their respective freedoms. Whoops, let's just die. You lost your battery life. Yep. So these two um, uh, agents are exchanged at the Glenacre Bridge, Potsdam, Germany, on February 10th, 1962. Rudolf Abel goes home, a hero of the Soviet Union, a ticker tape parade is on it, postage stamp in his likeness, medals for his heroics. Dad comes home to an American public that doesn't really know what to make of this ordeal. They read editorials in the newspaper that he had defected, had landed the plane intact, had spilled his guts and told the Soviets everything he knew, or that he hadn't followed orders and committed suicide, all of which were part truths, mistruths, and innuendos of the time. Dad was extensively debriefed by CIA, Kelly Johnson, the designer of the airplane, State Department officials, Air Force officials for about three weeks. During this time period, having read the debriefing transcripts in their entirety, for the first three or four days, the CIA debriefers keep coming back to one question. Frank, are you sure you were at altitude when you were shot down? Well, yes, I was at 70,500 feet. I had just vectored in for the next target, bright orange flash, shockwave, down he went. The next day, Frank, are you sure that you were at 70,000 feet? You didn't descend at all. Nope, like I said yesterday, I was at 70,500 feet. I had vectored into the next course. Uh, the missile exploded, pushed the plane forward. I bailed out. Um, and we found out through other research that the reason the CIA kept coming back to this topic is that NSA had picked up radio transmissions from the day of the event, from the Soviet communications, 
all the chatter going back between the missile command, the Air Force that was trying to scramble jets to intercept my father, uh, and other uh, communication. It was a little hectic that day on May Day with missiles going off and fighters being scrambled and communication going back and forth. The NSA picked up that the Russians were saying the plane is descending. So they, NSA, thought that my father had descended prior to being shot down or hit by a MiG. Uh, once my father was returned home and went through the debriefing process, that's when the CIA realized, oh crap, the Soviets actually do have a missile that can get up to 70,000 feet. The SA-2, the new and improved missile, not the SA-1 that had been used for the four years prior. So this is when they first realized that the Soviet capability was such that they could shoot down the U-2 at 70,000 feet. To show that point, uh, U-2 was shot down October 27, 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis, SA-2 missile. Four or five U-2s were shot down over mainland China, flown by Taiwanese pilots in the mid-60s, SA-2 missiles. So dad happened to be the very first person shot down at altitude of 70,500 feet by an SA-2 missile. And at first, Dulles even said in June of 1960, the most likely cause of the U-2 incident is a flame out, that the plane had descended. And this is how this rumor started to take hold and continues to this day. Fletcher Prouty, how many people here know about him? Yes. Okay. Um, he may have gotten it right with the JFK assassination, he may not have. I know that he didn't get it right with the U-2 incident. Um, we have photographs here. One of his theories is that the Hikon B camera that was in the U-2 was substituted out for an inferior camera, a World War II bomber camera, um, so, so that, one moment. So here we have a, a picture of what a Hikon B camera looks like. And this is the camera that was in the U-2 on May 1st, 1960. According to Fletcher Prouty, it was not. It was substituted out because the CIA knew the plane was gonna go down. They didn't wanna have a good expensive camera in there. They wanted an antiquated camera instead. So this is a picture of the Hikon camera. And I want you to pay special attention to the very bottom piece, the black, uh, a lens focal point where the lens is at the very bottom of the, of the camera. Unfortunately, I can't turn this, but you'll see on the right picture on display at the very top, the bottom piece of that camera with the lens. So this was on display in Moscow in 1960 as part of my father's trial being used as evidence against him. And I'm gonna blow that up. Okay, maybe not. And then this is the actual photo from the table of the underside of the uh, Hikon B camera. You can see the star configuration around the lens. You can see the U-shaped of the uh, a piece of equipment. And you can see up at the very top the little ID tag uh, telling basically what it is. So this shows that the right camera was on the plane. This then therefore disproves Fletcher Prouty's theory that the cameras were switched. If you start chipping away at his theories, you'll find that he didn't have a, my father didn't have a flame out, it wasn't sabotage, it was not intentionally uh, sabotaged or forced down to uh, 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 screw up the Paris Summit Conference a few days later. So this I'm trying to show is that if one part of his theories and arguments wrong, others may be as well. Now this map here, is a so is the Soviet hold on we get rid of the there we go so this map here is the Soviet version of what took place it was made by um, Lieutenant General G S Leganov 
1998, according to data from their radar. And at the very bottom, you'll see that at 8.40 a.m., the U-2 is uh, trying to be intercepted by an Su-9. A theory came out in 1998 that the Su-9 zoomed up to the U-2, the jet wash of his engine caused the U-2 to tumble out of the sky. This happened at 8.40 a.m. The Su-9 over-zoomed, over-flew um, the U-2. It went down and landed eventually at the airport. As the U-2 continues to fly at 8.45 a.m., at 8.50 a.m., it gets into reach of the SAM site. Uh, at 8.53, the first missile shoots down the U-2 at 70,500 feet. At the same time, this other plane, a MiG, is coming up and trying to intercept the plane, uh, getting close to it, trying to track it. It is then confused as the U-2, continuing to move forward, even though the U-2 had been shot down. The MiG continues to circulate up in the map. You can see the path. It says it's descending, starting to land back at the airport. He circles back around. You can see it from the very upper left corner, 9.20 a.m. He's starting to land into the airfield. At 9.23 a.m., he's hit by a second missile. And therefore, this is when the NSA picked up, the plane is descending. So they confused the U-2 descending with the MiG that was actually descending after trying to intercept the U-2. So this is a Soviet version of what took place, which is basically very similar, if not identical, to what my father told everybody when he came back home and was debriefed. I had the privilege of talking to Fletcher Prouty by phone, uh, got to be 10 years ago or now or so before he passed away. Um, he explained his rationale for why he thought it was sabotage, and I explained that, well, my father, through his debriefing conference and his debriefing uh, transcripts, uh, shows otherwise. Fletcher Prouty could not get past June 6th of 1960 when Alan Dulles said it was a flameout. He ignored any other information that was brought to surface after that date, including my father's testimony, his book, and other books that were written at the time that showed it was the near miss of an SA-2 missile and not any other cause. So it's, it's interesting that these theories continue to circulate around. And even today, 55 years after the fact, they continue to circulate around. And what I think happens is like we used to use microfilm and microfish as kids to do research. Today we use Google. We type in May 1st of 60. We type in February 10th of 62. Up pops the Washington Post, the New York Times. You can read the misinformation, write about the misinformation, hand the misinformation in for a graded paper, and then it perpetuates itself. Um, scholars and students sometimes don't find more recent information. That in 1998, there was a declassification conference hosted by the CIA and the Air Force that helps to set the record straight. Uh, you may not find that in May of 2000, the 40th anniversary of the U-2 incident, Dad was posthumously awarded with a POW medal for his incarceration, uh, the, the Distinguished Flying Cross, and a special medal from the then Director of CIA, George Tenet, the Director's Medal for Extreme Fidelity and Courage in Line of Duty. And as recently as four years ago, June of 2012, you might not find that Dad was posthumously awarded with a Silver Star. So even though the truth is out there, uh, we are confident that uh, what I just told you is correct. Um, there are still people out there that will believe Fletcher Crowdy or other books because there's no evidence that shows one way or the other if those theories are true or not. And there's always, quote unquote, oh, my father was lying. He was complacent in this. He was ordered to uh, tell people this. Don't lie so much. And there's so much stuff I've read and heard and learned over the years. And it all adds up that he was shot down at altitude and that there was no conspiracy at the time to um, uh, ruin the summit conference. Um, and I would be glad to take questions and uh, try to run any of the answers. I got about two minutes ish. Yes. Oh, I got about 10 minutes ish. Yes. Um, I find it unusual that the mission was to take place on May 1st, May Day, the high holiday in the Soviet Union. Um, and I don't know if it was unusual or not. Um, Eisenhower at the time had advocated no flight after May 1st. Um, so May 1st was the last day they could do it. 
and, and they looked at April 27th, 28th, and 29th. The weather, the weather was bad. bad. May 1st, the clouds part. That guy gets uh, sorted out right to the mission. Yes, yes ma'am. My name, my name is Chad and Neil Willis. My father was Freddie Spinero. And for those who missed my speech yesterday, I would like to corroborate what you stated. He was Naval Intelligence and CIA. He made the lenses that went in the cameras. He was Photo Intelligence with Bank 62 over Cuba. He uh, figured out if uh, he could get those cameras into Russia and measure a shadow on a radar antenna, they would know what frequency the Russians were transmitting on. He carried this 50 years uh, to his, almost to his grave. He was also CIA as well. And I have copies of his documentations and the aerial photographs as well. So I will exchange information with you when you. you are done. And I appreciate the service that your father did since we have this in common. And uh, it's a phenomenal thing that you have spoken up. We appreciate it very much. All right, thank you very much for the comment. First of all, thank you for being here. I appreciate your honor. Uh, just, I've always had questions about your father, I, your father's death. I just thought that someone so bright wouldn't, quote, run out of gas. It just seemed completely odd that he would just run out of gas. And here's too smart a person. So I'll just ask you what you think, and thank you again. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as you heard, the gentleman was asking about my father's death. He died in 1977, August 1st, in a helicopter crash while working for um, NBC television. And my research shows the following. Now, I'm gonna, I'm, not everybody in my family believes this, but I'm going to tell you what I believe. Dad had complained the week before that his fuel gauge was misreading. He had 20 more minutes of flying time than it was recorded and he missed out on some very good footage that could have been used for the evening news. That week before August 1st, the helicopter is in for an overhaul. The mechanics fix the problem, we think. And they don't tell Dad that the fuel gauge has been fixed to be accurate, or Dad doesn't read it in the logbook. So he's flying on August 1st with the assumption he has 20 more minutes of flying time that is registered on the fuel gauge. 10 minutes from the airport, helicopter runs out of gas, crashes, he and the camera are killed. That's what I believe happened. Now, my mom did not. She thought the CIA got I believe that my mom was so in love with my father that she couldn't admit it, couldn't let it go, couldn't bring herself to think that her husband, which was such a good pilot, allowed this to happen. So I believe that even though my mom felt otherwise, that it was an accident and that it was not intentional uh, killing of my father. Um, if it was, I probably wouldn't be able to be here and talk to you about this. I, I would probably be as screwed up as anybody else who's lost a son, a father through political assassination or something like that. But it, it's for my sanity, I think, I believe this. I, I don't know what I would do if I uncovered information to the contrary. But so far, no information has ever surfaced that I have seen that leads me down that rabbit hole. Right now, to my knowledge, Dad was killed in a helicopter crash. It was an accident by running out of gas. Why would you think Fletcher Browning said what he did when uh, it, it really adds up in so many ways because we know we didn't want peace with Russia. We wanted to keep that action alive, and it, it just adds up too well. Well, um, in regards to Fletcher Prouty and his theories on the U-2 incident, I'm not sure why he advocates what he does. I'm not sure why he overlooked evidence that was available when he was alive about the cameras that were in the U-2. Um, it might be that it fits nicely with his theories and ties the secret government together behind the scenes. Uh, it might be that as a uh, researcher, he was a little overzealous on this particular point. Uh, it might be that um, uh, he thought it was the truth. So uh, there's a difference of opinion here. Uh, I don't want to badmouth Mr. Crowdy. I have respect for him. Uh, but I just believe he got it wrong with this detail of his series. Uh, quick comment. Uh, your your uh, presentation corroborates uh, Victor Blanco's uh, testimony about the U-2 incident. Mm -hmm. I, so that, that, I made that connection. Good. But I believe he stated that the, the plane was shot down with kind of a volley. 
uh, of, of missiles, like they were just like a shotgun method of shooting it down. Uh, is that, do you know anything about that? Um, it, up until I got the, this uh, Soviet schematic of the U-2 sequence, um, I thought that eight missiles were fired, one of them got close enough to, to uh, uh, damage the tail section. Um, there are different reports. Uh, 15 years ago, people thought 14 missiles were fired. Um, then Chris Pocock, a leading expert in the U-2 incident, U-2 program, came out with eight missiles were fired. And that's what I've been saying ever since he and I have chatted. And then when this came out, it looks like three missiles were fired. So, yes, there's still a little confusion as to the number of missiles. We know there was more than one, no more than eight. And one other thing before I turn this over to uh, the next presenter, who is a U-2 pilot who knew my father, uh, and I'll give him an introduction in just a moment. I want to read you uh, this letter that my, sen uh, my father wrote to Senator Frank Church in September of 1975. Now, this will probably lead to the conspiracy that my father was killed. But I can't not share this. Because circumstances, I don't put anything past the CIA. I just don't, I don't think that they killed my father at this point in time. If other evidence surfaces in the future, I'll let you know. Um, so my father is getting a little perturbed over the years that the misinformation continues to circulate around and that he is being mistreated uh, by the government uh, because of no fault of his own. And so he writes to the Senator Church, and he basically, I'm gonna read this letter, it should take just a few minutes to go through. Um, I have followed the CIA hearings with a great deal of interest and would like to congratulate you and your committee on the much needed job you're doing. The reason for this letter are twofold. First, CIA Director William Colby stated I was the first person to be issued shellfish toxin for my flight on May 1st, 1960. This may be true, because I know very little about poisons, but it conflicts with what I remember being told by the CIA at the time, and also conflicts with what the Russian experts who examined the poisons testified during my trial. They concluded that the poison was of the Kirari group. Regardless of what type, had my father injected himself with this needle, he would have suffocated, it would have shut down the central nervous system, he would have died. Second, I have hesitated to bring this up, second point, uh, being afraid it would be considered sour grapes. But since my name was brought into the inter investigation by Mr. Colby on September 16, 1975, I have decided to write this letter. There is, in my opinion, another matter which should be investigated by your committee. It does not concern assassinations or anything as dramatic as that but it does concern the misuse of what vast power of the CIA against American citizens with whom the CIA has a grudge, either real or imagined. I am a living example of that misuse of power. Because of the CIA, I was discharged from my engineering test pilot position at Lockheed Aircraft Corporation in 1970. This discharge came in the same month I allowed the CIA to see a manuscript of my book, Operation Overflight. Lockheed later hired other pilots to do the same job I was doing, several of them with no experience in the U-2 aircraft. No attempt was made to recall me to the job. I was told by a friend after I had applied for a position at another aerospace corporation that instructions had been received to give me the grand tour, but I was not to be hired. Later, NSA was looking for U-2 pilots. I was not considered for the job, even though I was better qualified than most, if not all, the other pilots who were employed. As the result of either direct or indirect CIA action, I was unemployed for about three years and feel myself very lucky to be employed now, even though my present employment does not compensate as well as the early positions. I feel I have been made an example for other people whom the CIA wants to keep in check. I am not the only one who knows I did a good job in my country. I have paid my dues, including all those two years in Russian prison. I see no reason I should have been punished by the CIA, apparently because the U-2 incident happened to be an embarrassment to some people. I only did what the CIA told me to do, and I did it well. And in retrospect, my two years in a Russian prison was easy when compared to my treatment by the CIA. I had broken Russian laws and was punished because I was guilty but I broke no U.S. or CIA laws, and I find it hard to understand why I have been troubled, uh, treated in a the above manner. Thank you for your attention to my letter. Should you think there is any merit in the above, I am willing to aid you in any way I can. 
So this, this was written in 75. My father dies a year and a half later, August 1st, 77. Coincidence? Possibly. Uh, possibly not. But as I told you earlier, there's no evidence I've ever uncovered that leads me down that path that the CIA killed my father. I believe currently that it was an accident and that he ran out of gas. But I do want to share this with you because it's an important part of this Cold War history and my father's involvement in the matter. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gary Howard Jr. Gary will now introduce our next speaker, Greg Gregory.